You know, Vignoles, you really should make more of an effort to attend with these bashers. <laughs> Too many stuffed shirts enjoying the sound of their own voices, sir. I'm not sure I learnt anything, if I'm honest. You are a detective inspector for the railway police, Vignoles. I know they're not the most inspiring bunch, but if you wish to take over from me in due course, you'd do well to get your face better known at HQ. I remember Albert Pierrepoix, the public executioner. He gave a speech at a conference I attended a few years back. Was he dressed in black and carrying a scythe? No. But he was an intriguing character, and a better public speaker than what we heard today. He explained that executioners tend to hold down rather uninteresting day jobs. You see, they only execute part-time, so they need a regular occupation as well. Anyway, he gave a rather interesting address regarding our responsibility to seek out the truth in each and every case that we investigate. Of course, we are not judge and jury. We just deliver the prisoner and the evidence, and we let others decide. I take some comfort in that. We do our duty, sir, whatever we think about capital punishment. You're not an abolitionist, are you? A thing's ever so clear-cut. Unpicking the truth can be hard. People can play clever tricks with the truth. Did I ever tell you about the Woodhead case I worked back in 38? Please do. It concerns a young woman who suffered a horrible death in the Woodhead tunnels having apparently fallen from a train. We were unable to determine if she had suffered a blow before the fall because she was run over by a following goods train. We inspected the locks on, locks on the coaches. Was there a fault with the mechanism? No, it was working perfectly, leaving us with two options. Did she jump or was she pushed? Sadly, answers free of unreasonable doubt were never achieved. As you said, Charles, people can play clever tricks with the truth. Edwin Plumpton was the owner of a shop fitting firm, which once thriving, was now on the verge of collapse. He was facing bankruptcy, which was the cause of many quarrels with his wife, Alice. Alice suffered from what the medics called melancholia. Whether this was an underlying threat or an illusion that she was happy to create, we will never truly know. <laughs> one return ticket to Victoria and one single, please. First class, of course. <laughs> Alice, darling, wait for me on the platform. Introverted as Alice was, her twin sister was the opposite. Ruby Caswell was unmarried. She owned a fashionable store selling millinery to wealthy ladies, although she had been hit by the nation's recent economic problems, whilst Alice gave the appearance of a sweet and calm person. Ruby was passionate and fiery. She seethed with resentment towards her sister who she perceived had married well. Despite their differences, Ruby had invited Alice to come and stay with her for a while, for a change of scenery. They say a change can be as good as a rest. You could say a permanent rest cure was being planned. Edwin Plumpton would accompany his wife to Sheffield, deliver her into her sister's care, and then return home. I assume it was Alice who fell from the train. You were jumping the gun, Charles. Oh, uh, perhaps we should continue this on the platform?
flexible. Hopping to the restaurant car, would you like anything? Waiting here all day, you see? Shh, wait. Not now. Not yet. And keep your voice down. Your sister's a few compartments away. But I want you. Don't you want me? <sighs> what have you? All that he asked for. <laughs> It'll be worth it, my darling. I'll make sure of that. You stay here. When the time is right, I know three times, you go to the dining room. I make a show of being Alice, return to the compartment before the meal arrives. Depart the train at Penistone and drive to Sheffield, by which point my darling sister will be long departed. I know the plan, Eddie. You look just like her in that dress. Of course. The scarf, though. He'll be waiting for you. tips. Put the money on the nail and I'll get you a winner. Shh. Afterwards, when everything's arranged. Cash up front or I cut. We agreed half up front. Balance on the nine is what I said. Under the paper. a good horsepower. Take your seat and don't move till we pass Penistone. Something else. Join me for a drink. I would simply love to.
Did you identify the hitman? Never got anything to stick mind. But then more powerful forces did for him. The Blitz. But as for the knight in question, well, there was no reason for him to run any further risk, was there? There was no chance that Edwin Plumpton would chase after him for failure to deliver. Edwin and his sister-in-law got their fingers burned. In fact, the hitman left the train at the next station. But as for the Plumptons... Something I have to get from the compartment, darling. It won't be long. Will you order for me? Of course, darling. Don't be too long. <laughs> um, ready to order, sir, or should I wait for your wife to return? My wife? Uh-oh. She's just gone back to the compartment, but I have my instructions to order for her. The, the roast beef, please, for the both of us. <laughs> Edwin should have been tried as an accessory to intended murder. Alice was unscathed. The hitman failed to carry out his task. 
Edwin was, at best, an accessory to a crime that was never committed. While Ruby was technically an accessory to her own murder. Fact stranger than fiction. Do you believe that Ruby was murdered? The key question is what, if anything, did Alice know? Well, what followed was frankly a succession of lies and counter lies that would be too tedious to recount. I began to wonder if Edwin or Alice knew what was fact and what was fiction before the end of my investigation. But you're confident Edwin and Ruby intended to do away with Alice? We found persuasive evidence that Edwin was plotting to murder his wife. There was insurance documents taken out six weeks prior. But these were less than useful in determining why Ruby ended up dead. Was Alice ever accused of Ruby's murder? No. It was declared an accident due to her not noticing that the door was open or being thrown against it by the jolt of the train. But you don't think it was an accident? No. She could have boxed clever, played along with the visit, dressed the same as Ruby, pretended to fall asleep in the compartment. If she were aware of Ruby's presence, perhaps she dealt a blow and threw her from the train, or a violent altercation and the door sprung open and she fell. All scenarios that we considered but we could prove none of them. The Plumptons stuck steadfastly to their story and we hit the buffers. Interestingly, he lived with Alice for a few years afterwards. Do you think he was afraid for his own life? Perhaps. And there is an interesting coda to this story. I received this recently. It makes for interesting reading. I would like you to study it and decide what we should do with it going forwards. Radio, sir. On Tuesday morning at Manchester Central, a man tripped over some luggage and fell into the path of an oncoming train. My goodness. The coroner declared it an accident. The deceased's name was Edwin Plumpton. We took a witness statement from a Mrs. Wright whose luggage was involved in the incident. Only Mrs. Alice Wright had once been Mrs. Alice Plumpton. After so many years, this could just be coincidence. Perhaps, Vignoles. Perhaps. But a good detective is never entirely comfortable with such an explanation. This letter arrived on my desk. Nobody has read it but me. Before you read it, before you make any decisions, I want you to remember this. Edwin Plumpton was a scheming, adulterous liar who paid to have his wife murdered for monetary gain and carnal lust. Are things ever so clear cut, sir? People can certainly play clever tricks with the truth. 